Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's conversation starter. I am thrilled to be talking with Ernie Harburg and Dina Rosenberg Harburg. Ernie Harburg is a social psychologist and director of the Yip Harburg Lyrics Foundation, acronym YHLF, which is dedicated to his father, Yip Harburg's vision of social justice. And Dina Rosenberg Harburg is a writer, educator, and producer, executive and artistic director of the Yip Harburg Lyrics Foundation, and is dedicated to universal education through the arts, peace, and social justice, which is Yip's artistic legacy. So fitting, because that's one of the things we're going to be talking about today. So this conversation starter is incredibly fitting, as JMM would not have the title of our current exhibit, Brother Can You Spare a Dime, Jewish Artists of the WPA, if it were not for Yip Harburg. <laughs> so just a, a little bit of background, and then we'll, we'll get going with some questions. Sound good? Sounds yeah. good. Terrific. So this is just a little excerpt from the book uh, that Ernie Harburg and Harold Meyerson wrote, Who Put the Rainbow in the Wizard of Oz? Yip Harburg, lyricist. So in the course of a 50 year career as one of the leading lyricists of American theater and song, Yip or Y, excuse me, E-Y, Yip Harburg wrote the lyrics to some of the most widely known, provocative and brilliantly crafted songs from the heyday of the Broadway and Hollywood musical. Included among them, Over the Rainbow, April in Paris, only a Paper Moon, and Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? So this talented more man was born Isidore, is it Hochberg or Hochberg? Hochberg. Hochberg yeah. in New York City in 1896. He was the youngest of the four surviving children of Louis Hochberg and Mary Rising. Rising, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yiddish-speaking Orthodox Jews who immigrated to the U.S. from Belarus, Russia. Right. So can you tell us a little bit about the family and their background? Yeah, the first thing I'd like to say, the reason they left Russia was because of Tsar Nicholas II, who was having what they called the pogrom. Yes. They'd go into Russian ghettos, and they'd literally... Uh, murder and uh, destroy the area. So it was a question of uh, get out of here or stay here and die. So uh, Yip's father uh, took the decision probably to get out, which is an amazing, powerful thing for an immigrant to do, to leave your yes. land like that. And not all the people leave. The ones who go are usually, as immigrants, better educated and smarter. That's uh, been shown over and over again. <laughs> you get out the first one out, you know, it's a survival thing. All right, so when uh, Yip's father and uh, mother came to New York City, um, they had with them the oldest uh, son, uh, Max, who became a physicist and a worldwide uh, uh, intellectual. And uh, then uh, Yip came and he became a worldwide <laughs> uh, person also. So there must have been something in the genes there uh, with the father. The father had a very intimate relationship with Yip all the way. That's from uh, his cousin, uh, my cousin, who uh, was Yip's best friend throughout her, uh, their lives because Yip was at her birth. Um, and uh, she told me stories about how they the father would come home early and talk with uh, Yip read him the socialist uh, paper at that yeah. time in the Lower East Side. Sure. And, uh, in general, he himself was quite a guy, quite a guy. And the latest uh, 
we've learned about him is that probably one of Yip's uh, masterpiece uh, musicals was called Finian's Rainbow, mm -hmm. which was in 1947. And the, the lead player in there was a guy named Finian. And that seems to be uh, made from Yip's father. Ah. So those who know uh, the, the show can say what Yip is. And I'll just say one more thing about that. That at the end, when the father has lost everything he's had, his gold, his leprechaun, everything. In the show. In the, in show. the show. And the lights are uh, down and the audience is... Uh, and the, and the staff, everybody's looking at Finian. He, he moans and then he jumps up and he says, it's hopeless, but it's not serious. <laughs> and that's Yip right there. Okay, in a uh, nutshell, huh? In a nutshell, because he was born into a poverty area that Irving Howe said was, uh, more destructive of people than the Calcutta, which uh, city in uh, in uh, uh, India, mm -hmm. <clears throat> was quite quite devastating. Yeah. The poverty was uh, bad, very bad. Well, and, yeah. Yeah. So you've made you've made some some great you know laid some great foundation for you know the background of the the family and and some of the relationships and some of the the situations certainly and and you of course mention the family when they left russia was escaping you know persecution and violence um and and certainly anti-semitism and unfortunately you know that's something that you know many immigrants also faced in the US and, and sometimes that, that may have contributed to a decision to change a name. Sometimes that happened, you know, right when they came into the country and it was a, a given situation, but sometimes it was a choice. And uh, Yip, of course, born Isidore, um, took the name Edgar Harburg. Right. How, how did that come about? Well, Yip was always fooling around with his name ever since I, <laughs> I uh, started reading about him. He was uh, Irving, uh, uh, I think it was Y, oh, Y Harburg. Mm -hmm. so he had E, Y, no, he was Irving Y. Hochberg. That was his name. Okay. Uh, Isidore. 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 That's it. So he kept playing with it. He literally took the word Hochberg and changed the vowels in it to become Harburg, and Berg had a U in it, and H-A-R. Now, why he did all this, it was because he was a victim of uh, anti-Semitism. Yeah. And um, he, he dropped the Irving and became Edgar. And uh, now the, the, the why is interesting. Uh, when he was brought up on uh, 11th Street and Avenue C and playing in the, in the street like all the rest of the, like I did too in Brooklyn, <laughs> um, his mother would yell down, Ipsa, Ipsa. Ah, okay. A, 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 a Hebrew word yes. for a uh, little squirrel. That's what Yip is. Okay, well that makes sense. So, uh, so really a, a a a name that was out of love and uh, <laughs> or from his from his mother. So that's that that explains quite a bit. So so thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so talking about you know some of his early you know experiences, education, you know his environment. Um, you mentioned in your book that Yip had a fondness for Gilbert and Sullivan, and that was uh, something that he shared with his high school classmate, Ira Gershwin, who became a lifelong friend. Um, where did that interest in, in music and, and theater begin? Well, first, it first began, right, Ernie, um, when his father took him to the Yiddish theater, um, and, right. and he was 
very enamored, the Abanish father of uh, the musicals and plays, many of them very humorous. And so uh, Yip was in, into that humor and, um, you know, always trying to find the humor in situations, even if they could be looked at as not humorous. Um, yeah. Okay, so that, and then when he was five or something, he played Peter Pan, um, right? He, yes, in, in a, he had 64. <laughs> and and um, so uh, there was a, a teacher who took them all to see some shows uh -huh. in English, and one of them was Peter Pan. And uh, Yip uh, um, apparently was especially taken with this character. So the thing is, Yip uh, is quite famous for fantasy characters or larger than life characters. So this seems like an appropriate place to start. And then, okay, he, he went to the library a lot because uh, one reason was because he was uh, very cold at home in the cold water. Mm -hmm. That library was warm. Tompkins Square Library. Tompkins Square Library. <laughs> and um, so the librarians, uh, who he remembered very vid vividly and wrote about and so on and was interviewed about one interview uh, I did with him where he talked about the library and the librarians and uh, they used to give him books of poetry to read and and the thing was what he especially liked poetry and and uh, also prose and he liked uh, O. Henry short stories with the twist at the end which is where he sort of got a penchant for doing that. And so he was acting and, and writing uh, from, you know, his- But they were just poetry. They were just words. Okay, so then what happened was one of the books he was given was called Bab Ballads by um, W.S. Gilbert. Okay, mm -hmm. words to Gilbert and Sullivan. Right. So Ira, Gershwin and Yip Harburg because of G H, you know, they sat next to each other. They were seated alphabetically, together. right? Yeah, okay. yeah. And um, Ira said to you, "Did you know that um, those poems you're reading were set to music?" And so Yip had no idea of that. Okay, so then the Gershwins were a little better off than the Oakberg Harburgs, and so he brought uh, Yip home with him, and they had one of the early Victrolas where you could- Oh, play. wow. And he had uh, HMS Pinafore and all the famous Gilbert and Sullivan. So he played them for Yip. Yip's eyes were completely opened. This was what he, he really had said over and over uh, was, was the beginning of his interest in musical theater or music and words combined. The collaborative wow. poetry. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so a lot of a lot of layers there that uh, you know from you know kind of the in, you know the the circumstances of you know at home you know to pursue uh, heat in an environment being at the library and being exposed to the poetry and and kind of the the kismet of of the alphabetical seating yeah. <laughs> and uh, being you know taken home. Um, by the Gershwins and, you know, and ha being exposed to all that, that's, that's amazing. What an incredible, you know, multi-layered education. Yes. So you, you of course mention, um, you talk about Ira Gershwin and we know that, and, and you talked about, you know, where he was growing up and a little bit about the environment. So we know that some of Yip's lyricist contemporaries came from Similar, you know, circumstances are certainly a similar geographic area in terms of being Jewish immigrants who, who grew up on the Lower East Side of New York, um, which you spoke to a little bit, but could maybe can you expound on how that environment uh, and his heritage really shaped his career path? The only, the only lyricist who actually lived nearby, well, Irving Berlin. In poverty. In poverty. Okay. Uh, were, er, was Irving Berlin. Uh, Yip and Irving Berlin were extremely poor. Irving Berlin maybe more so. There were 17 kids in the family. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
The Gershwins lived nearby, but as you went west in New York City, neighborhoods got progressively a little better. Okay. Uh, Yip, Yip was on what known as Avenue C, 11th Street and Avenue C, and the Gershwins were on 2nd Avenue, which was about five blocks, five blocks uh, west for anyone who knows or doesn't know New York. <laughs> And by the time you were there on Second Avenue, you were better off. Okay, so so um, and and the Gershwin's father, Ira and George Gershwin's father, was had uh, jobs that were not all in sweatshops and so on. He had managed to um, perfect various skills. So and and he changed jobs all the time, and they moved um, to different apartments all the time. But they were mostly Yes, in the uh, East East Village of New York City, but um, not in the poorest sections. But they sure. moved 28 times. The Gershwins. And the Gershwins knew New York City like the palm of your hand. And they oh. took Yip everywhere. Right. So, wow. so that wow. they were exposed to every kind of theater, every kind of uh, song. You know, they... Uh, they went to the Cotton Club and were exposed to jazz and early jazz. And but on Second Avenue was the beginnings of Broadway with all Jewish theaters uh, working out of synagogues. And at this time, uh, you could still see the synagogue on the, on the side of the theater, the movie theater. There's a plot. But wow. the whole okay. Second Avenue from 14th Street down to Houston was Jewish theater. And that was the beginning of Broadway. Lower East. They all moved oh. up to the Broadway. Broadway. Yeah. So they've got kind of some of the vaudeville, a little bit yeah. lower, like, and then kind of moving oh. up in terms of the, the caliber a little bit yeah, and the but, production. <laughs> but these were all Jewish people, all right? So that the big guys on Broadway. Um, Rogers and Hart and no, no the producers. The uh, producers, uh, Schoenfeld. And Schoenfeld, yeah, owned half the theaters. There were forty-two theaters, and Niederlander were Jewish also. Yeah. All right, so it was a moving of the East Side uh, theater um, Jews up to Midtown. Right. Okay. So, and you know, and and and. Of we do know that, you know, because of some of the, you know, avenues for careers that ne weren't necessarily available to Jews, some yeah. of the, you know, yeah. the Hollywood, the, the music, you know, mm -hmm. they were really able to get in on, on some of the ground floor, if you will, to really make that, you know, yeah. cultural impact. Right. Well, it, it, we think, well, other people than, than Irving myself, um, that because Jews were a wandering people. Uh, they would assim they would assimilate many different um, sounds and uh, cultural elements from different places, uh, different uh, things they were exposed to. So they had very wide open ears. Uh, so uh, our, uh, Yip and Ira and George Gershwin um, talked about the street being almost a a place of, of higher education than informal one. Uh, they listened very carefully to the way people talked and they also listened, I was mentioning jazz, but they went to every kind of musical- Entertainment. And, yeah, any musical or theater entertainment. And it's documented, I mean, they wrote about it, that they went or they gave interviews where they talked about it. And yeah. so um, it's, it's something about Yet yeah, being Jewish, I guess that. Uh, but I, I think too, a, a very, you know, important point when you talk about being, you know, having ears open, being observant, being kind of, um, you know, interested in and certainly attuned to other sounds, you know, particularly when you think about, you know, the convergences that happened on Tin Pan Alley and, and you talk about, you know, the, the lessons, you know, in the street, you know, how, how that was so critical in, in influencing the sound. So that's amazing. That's amazing. And as uh, your next topic is going to be, brother, can you spare a die? That's right. <laughs> well, I was going to ask before we got into that, and and maybe you know, and maybe this ties in. But I'm curious where 
and how Yip got his big break? I mean, or, or was there a big break or was it more incremental? Well, first he uh, was a executive in electrical appliance uh, firm that his friend from City College had set up and Yip got into business and he and Ira and George went to every uh, show in town, as Dina just said. However, but, but Yip was a businessman. He was in business because his parents were still so poor. So yes, they wanted to get him. That's out. right. And also, when the World War I came along, and Yip was totally against it, um, he, he said it was a capitalist war. Uh, he got a job with. Uh, um, a big uh, firm down in uh, Uruguay in in South America. Mm. Stayed there for a couple of years. Learned the uke ukulele, the the guitar. Wow. He ran his own shows in the American colony. You know, that's incredible. Yes, and so by the time he came back and went into business, uh, George and Ira had been making a, a life, a career out of the new Broadway all through the 20s. And suddenly came, you could see the crash coming. And the stock uh, market. Crash. The stock market. Yeah, yeah. And Yip was already working with Jay Gorney okay. to get out of his job. But then the crash hit and wiped everybody out. Right, and, right. Uh, so, uh, the big opportunity was that, uh, what's the name of the producer? <laughs> uh, of which? Uh, At Broadway. McAvoy? No. No, they, they owned all the theaters. You just said it before. Joan Felder, you talking? Joan Felder, Niederlander, or? Yeah, well, who's the other guy? Yeah, I know. I, who, uh, the other guy is Drew Jampson. But no, come on. Another guy? We said yeah. The, the one you just said before. <laughs> Never mind. I'm having trouble remembering. Uh, there was a, a show uh, which was half vaudeville, and uh, that's the style at the time. Sure. Uh, this uh, producer called in Yip uh, to uh, help uh, write the songs. And um, oh, I remember the, the author of uh, T for Two. That's it. Was going to be the producer help. Oh, oh, that's it. Vincent Humans. Yes, him. But who's the producer? <laughs> uh, the thing is that um, Vincent, <laughs> Vincent Humans uh, 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 ran away with all the money, ten thousand dollars, and and they were going to oh. close. The, they were going to close the show. Yip ran, and uh, this is typical. Yip ran to Schubert, that's who it was. Okay. And convinced him that he, Yip, would get the show up, which Yip had never done on Broadway before. And he, Yip, got about 12 different uh, musicians, composers. composers, and about, uh, he listened, had them come in and listen for hours to what they call their trunk songs. Uh, songs which never got published, but which they had in the trunk of the- I the, see. You know, the piano trunk. You got know? it, got yeah. it. And, and Yip would listen, and he, because of his incredible musical talent, the uh, same way with Ira Gershwin, he could pick out the, the tunes, the music, uh, which uh, were appealing and skillful and, it maybe work. So when Jay came in, Jay played him his uh, trunk song. And on the fourth song, um, Yip said, wait a minute, wait a minute. It went. It was a love song. But it went, the melody went, da 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 and so on. Straight out of his grandmother's singing to him. Right, it's, from a, a Yiddish lullaby, right? Yiddish Russian lullaby. His grandmother said. So sang that's to him. Yip heard that and he said, How about throwing out the lyrics that go with it? Because they made it into a love song. For one show. And let's do it some some different lyrics. Okay. So they tried another one, which was a satire on on uh, Rockefeller. 
give okay. back nickels and dimes during the depression. And then one time long walk in the evening in Central Park, a guy came over to them and he, he said, uh, brother, can you spare a dime? And they both looked at each other and said, that's it, that's it. That's it, that's and it. Yip went <clears throat> and went and he and Jay worked on the song, but uh, the lyrics, which were, uh, as you said in your comments, were about the nation and about Europe and about the Great Depression, which was worldwide. And it was larger than life. It was a kind of uh, a disaster that uh, nobody could respond to it. And the publishers literally censored all the songs except the love song and the happy song. Happy days are here again, you know, just like they're doing now with the Bible. Well, they were trying to buoy spirits, right? You know, but that you you weren't allowed to do anything except love song. Well, you uh, uh, put his song. He finally got it up to lyric. The thinking about once I built a railroad, made it run, made it race against time. Once I built a railroad. Now it's done, brother, can you spare a dime? And then at the end, he said, buddy, can you spare a dime? And I want Dina to talk about how the music came first, the title, which was, you always had to have a title. Now every composer wanted a title, mm -hmm. came into them from the streets. And the uh, poetry set to the music in collaboration with Jay Gordy, who is also from, public, from Russia, um, became, rather, became a song, a very incredible song that went around the nation instantly yeah. and around the world and is still playing and we're still collecting royalties. <laughs> it's, it's quite incredible. I mean, as, as you say, became you know the anthem for for this era, the Great Depression. But but really struck a note very early on, and and requests for recordings coming you know coming in from you know Bing Crosby, Rudy Valley, and of course Al Jolson covered it. And it continues to be covered. Yeah. So. Yeah. Now, Dina, you want to say something well, about the song? Okay. Howard. Yeah. Okay, well, the major thing about the song, or there are two major things that are- At yeah, least. <laughs> no, there are, uh, maybe there are dozens, but two that characterize Yip very uh, strongly. Uh, one is that um, uh, he, he w might've been talking about every man, what a majority or a large, uh, third of the nation were going through. Um, but he made the song about one man, once I built a railroad. Oh, oh yeah. When, wait, we don't get to Al yet. Oh, okay. okay, then once I built the tower. Um, and then uh, I, I was, I fought for this country once in khaki boots. <laughs> Gee, we look swell, full of that Yankee doodle dee dum. And then after that, the sort of the climax comes, say, don't you remember? Right. Don't you remember? They, they called me and it out. Goes up. It goes up. The music goes up. Okay. But they calling them Al. Yeah. Um, he had a name. It wasn't just any old builder yeah. uh, or any soldier. Okay. This, I have a name. Okay. Um, it was Al all the time. Say, don't you remember? I'm your pal. I worked with you. I helped make this country great. Okay. And then it was buddy instead of brother, which it was all the way through. It culminated in the buddy, can you spare a dime, which was a dramatic sort of climax to the brother. And um, so Yip often talked about the, uh, the fact that um, in order to write something universal, you have to write something that also works 
for an individual. So an individual can identify with it and a group can identify it with it. And by the way, about the melody, it's also the beginning of the uh, Israeli national anthem, followed by Leva. Okay, so, and it right. and there, wow. yeah, and it also um, was picked up from the Russian, Russian lullaby aspect or Russian Jewish lullaby yeah. by uh, classical uh, uh, composers as themes for their uh, tone poems and symphonies. So that resonated very deeply, maybe. Clearly, yes, yes. They collaborated. Okay, yes. So they were kind of writing this song at the same time. Usually at that time, or the 20s, 30s, 40s, the- 20s. I said 20s, 30s, 30s 40s. Yeah. The, we, we banter, okay? <laughs> I love it, I love it. We've been married almost 40 years, and I was a child bride. We Mazel tov. How wonderful. <laughs> we banter. Uh, so anyway, right. It is funny. <laughs> um, so Ernie has yip sense of humor. Uh, also, this is an aside. Uh, people say, oh, you married into a famous family. Well, I knew yip well before I knew Ernie. So I didn't marry into the family of my husband's, you know, great father. I knew the father, and actually the father introduced me to the sons. Ah. She got a job with Yip, and Yip told me to go down and help her create the musical theater program at NYU, which Yip wanted to te teach at. Okay, it's a, yeah. It's you. So a little bit of a, a shidduch in mind as well here, maybe, yeah? Well, we're all wrapped together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ernie, as his social psychologist, like you said, was a consultant to executives under stress. So you've said I was an executive under stress. Which he was. <laughs> okay, but uh, putting that aside, so you got this particular guy, Al, and then the music and lyrics, yeah. So uh, it's pretty, uh, uh, it's resonant music, but it's also music that, as I said, is sort of, tied to the fact that a person is singing it. So Yip right. recognized that in the music because all of the lyrics weren't written before all of the music. The title was there. Okay, we, okay but that melody exists as in, in, or the beginnings of it in Jay's, you know, trunk. Re and re right, right. right. Culture. Yes, and of course. Um, wow. So, so the, it's a very, um, well, go into it too much, but since your exhibit is Brother Can You Spare a Dime, with all those resonances of trying to illuminate the song as much as possible, so. That's, in, wow, thank you. Those are some amazing insights. So, um, you know, you, you talked about, you shared in connection both with, you know, the writing of Brother Can You Spare a Dime and, and certainly, you know, how his career was shaped that, you know, the, the chill of poverty never left his bones. Um, yeah. I'm going to lead in, I'm going to use that to segue into Over the Rainbow. Right. So, <laughs> which of course, it becomes this, you know, tremendous success. Over the Rainbow was written for 1939's The Wizard of Oz. Harold Arlen, in collaboration with Yip, wrote the music and lyrics for Over the Rainbow, which earned an Academy Award, um, which must have been a, a whole nother level when, when you think about, you know, his origins and you know some of his early experiences how, how how did he reflect i mean what was that like for him well i just want to say one thing that uh, neither harold Arlen nor yip harburg had read baum's um the children's, Wizard of book. Our, children's book but they read it for the first time and then suddenly yip who was into this thinking of universality began to see heart, brains, and nerve, and, and a, something that never happened before in a musical, even today, it's, been, it's almost not there. An adolescent was the protagonist, the leading figure in the story. So that itself was totally uh, unusual and yeah. it swept around the world, the 
there were always a family looking at the film on TV when it came out in the 50s so that uh, on television and television you'd get uh, audiences of 50 60 million at a shot everywhere in the world where it played in Europe and South America and it all had it came at a bound but what Yip did with Arthur Freed, who never got any credit for anything. He was he, a producer. So, mm. A Soviet producer. They designed the first um, uh, ever film of an integrated theatrical film about an adolescent girl. Totally, totally amazing. And the things that Baum was saying in there were speaking to everybody in the world. And Yip took a hold of it. Yip and Arthur Freed took a hold of it and made it into a universal artistic thing with all the songs that he and uh, Harold did. And in regard to Over the Rainbow, that Can was- I talk about that? Yes, the last song they got to was Over the Rainbow for Dorothy. And it was thrown out of the yeah. film seven times. Oh, no. Yeah. I'll let Dina talk no, about well, that. No, well, Larry can talk about that no. very well. All I want to talk about Saw. Not, yes, but I wanted to tie Brother Can You Spare a Dime oh, to yes. Over the Rainbow. Correct, that, right. Um, they frame the decade, the, the 30s. Yeah. In other words, you're starting with this Brother Can You Spare a Dime in the deepest depression. Okay, so you get to the end of the decade when, yeah, what was looming was, uh, you know, the war clouds and the... Right. Hitler right. So on. On the other hand, there was hope in this country that it was getting back on its feet with the WPA and, and FDR. And FDR. And so, um, very uh, insightful uh, New York Times critic Stephen Holden wrote that um, Yip and o Over the Rainbow is a song <clears throat> of hope and humor in hard times. Okay, so what, what you're doing is kind of bookending a little bit yeah and even more so yip was famous um i mean it's a trademark yip for asking questions in his songs especially at the end of his songs so that what happened was the listener couldn't just sit back passively they had they were challenged okay the question needs an answer and it needs an answer from whoever's listening um, and so you're sort of forced to consider what's going on. Uh, it's like the Socratic method where they, he asks. That's, that's that. incredible. That's, so you that have, he's engaging, you know, the audience and, and asking them to, you know, to consider everything that's being addressed. It's from so Socrates back in Greece. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, it questions make you think. Uh, <laughs> But so the, what you said, brother, Mark, can you spare a dime as a question? But before and that, April in Paris is what have you done with my heart? And Paper Moon is if you believed in me. Do you believe in me? It's, yeah. it's, it's implicit. However, let's it's sticking with uh, Dime and Rainbow. Go so, ahead. Yeah. Um, in Dime also, it, it has a lot of questions before getting into the refrain, which is once I built a railroad, the guy is leading up to that. And the line is, why should I be standing in line waiting for bread? Why? Okay. Uh, if I, you know, am, am someone who built the nation, the, you know. Right, right. Nation. Okay, so. And, and they're still asking the question. Okay, yes, they should be. Okay, and people don't necessarily have good answers yet, but. There's, Biden is trying. Biden is <laughs> trying a little bit, F, and FDR did. Yes. Okay, so then with Over the Rainbow, the question it leaves you with is, why, oh, why can't I? Okay, so... In a question, yes. Yes, a, a, yeah. a question. Yeah. But the implicit answer should be to people, yes, you can. <laughs> In other words, that was Obama's slogan. <laughs> All right, I mean, Yeah. Yes, yes, we can. Mm -hmm. and, and another Jewish man named Einstein said, if you can't tell what you're doing on the research to a six-year-old, you don't know what you're talking about. And that a, a question 
for the research is in a question that has an answer in it. So, 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 but if you don't know it, that's, it's like yeah. your problem, but you have to find it and you better find it fast. It's yeah. urgent. Yeah. Uh, the, the people in the depression, you know, were at, in a terrible uh, time and place. Okay. They like couldn't. Like the virus. Uh, like the virus. Yeah. I, uh, uh, is a bad time and place. Yeah, that's true. We're back to it, um, unfortunately. <laughs> and but then the, with the over the rainbow, okay. So the why then or why can't I? Okay, with this implicit answer because that's what she does. It launches the movie. So right. if it's yes, I can. Then that's what she does. She goes over the rainbow. Okay, so um, it's often considered uh, an immigrant song. Uh, mm -hmm. There are it's. Again, over the rainbow, like brother, can you spare a dime? Applies to individuals in whatever way it applies to each individual, starting with Dorothy, but uh, with adolescents. Yeah, adolescents. Yeah. But apparently, it speaks to kids, sure, to, to older people, you know, and everybody in between is what we've been. Well, they have their own age grades. Now you're an adult, you have to do this. Now yeah. you're an older person, you have to do this. It's the question of who am I continues throughout and why can't I continues throughout every life. grade of your yeah. life. Yeah. And well, so, yeah. The, I mean, so many incredible insights there. Wow. I ju I'm just trying to digest all of this. <laughs> um, I know we could, you know, talk for forever, but we kind of, you know, need to wrap it up a little bit. So um, well, you've already spoken a little bit about, you know, well, quite a bit about what Yip stood for, you know, what things were important to him, you know, certainly contributions, you know, uh, in, in many cases, you know, things that have never been done before. Um, you know, what would you say is, is Yip's legacy? I, I would say that he addressed himself to universal questions both as a poet and as a songwriter. And he, he found those uh, composers who could be in tune <laughs> with him so that he insisted on having the music first. And then he set the meaning of that music. And you can't have a song done by two people, a composer, and a lyricist as one. You can't say that one person wrote the song, mm -hmm. which is said all over the place now. Nobody knows Yip Harburg because they talk about Harold Arlett, the composer. There is no one person that does a great song at that time. It was two people. And in Dina's book, uh, which actually won millions of dollars for the Gershwin family because oh, well, that's not, the, not judge, me. the judge ruled she can't that have time for this I have read Dina's book and I understand that, that the a song is written by two people equally. You cannot say that the composer wrote the song or the lyricist wrote the song. They both wrote the song. So when you say it's Harold Arlen's song, you're wrong. Or George Gershwin's song. Or George right. Gershwin. that, it's, that it's a collaboration, yeah. Now, what is not said is that the lyricist wrote the song because all the music came over from Europe in a classical operatic form, and nobody knows. They say that Verdi, for instance, wrote the whole opera. Well, that's nonsense, total nonsense. And, and Verdi doesn't even know what a lyric is. So uh, we have to get out a whole campaign, and I'm glad I'm talking with you, about <laughs> that a song, at least American songs at that time, and particularly Brother Can You Spare Dynamics, was written by the background of the songwriters and the two songwriters work together as one person. 
and the song is a, 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 a not a mixture, but a compound of putting something together so that uh, every single note has a uh, lyrical meaning to it, yeah. or several meanings. Yes. Okay, well, 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 if you want, well, I'm, I can say it in one sentence about okay. it. Okay, yeah. sure. The legacy. Okay, Ernie's absolutely right uh, about uh, the contributions to um, uh, songwriting with the, these particular songs and um, raising the craft of, of or art of lyric writing to, to a new dimension. Okay, but first of all, Yip's main songs are not love songs. He wrote some great ones, but if you look at the ones that people know, all of the Wizard of Oz, none of them have anything to do with love. Brother, Can You Spare a Dime doesn't. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you look at that Framing the Decade, um, those two greatest songs maybe of, of Yip's, though, uh, you know, I don't want to cast- One with Jay Gordy and one with uh, Harold Orlin. Yes, but I'm trying to make the point that they weren't about love. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they absolutely. They, and as Ernie said, they were about universal. Um, right. Here. And the other huge point is that Yip was sort of known as uh, Broadway's social conscience. And he didn't write anything that didn't draw on his background from, you know, the chill of poverty nev never left my bones. There had to be humor as well. But um, the social conscious, okay, so if you start with Brother Can You Spare a Dime, and then people don't think of The Wizard of Oz as political, but in fact, it has certain political aspects, namely that the two, the, the land of Oz, uh, Emerald City and uh, Munchkin Land, they're kind of utopian lands. They right. are run by dictators. They're kind right. of a egalitarian uh, society there. Yeah. They're not ruled by religion, religion, religious intolerance and so on. And then you go through Yip's life and you find that every major uh, song and show that he wrote uh, has that, that the great stage show, uh, Finian's Rainbow. So it's, it's the asking of questions and the social consciousness uh, of, of Yip Harbor that make him unique. Uh, nobody, uh, uh, none of his peers had that kind of uh, philosophy that traces through his life and his songs. Uh, and the people. Wow. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's an amazing summary. And, and I think it's so fitting, um, particularly when we're talking about, you know, the exhibit and um, certainly some of the parallels between, you know, the Great Depression and, and what you know, we as a society have been experiencing, you know, in the great lockdown, as, I, as I've been referring to it. Um, and I know that we could talk for forever, so I, and that there's, you know, much more to Yip's legacy. So before we wrap up, I do want to point out, um, of course, the book, which I'm sure you're seeing backwards here, uh, yeah. but uh, Who Put the Rainbow in the Wizard of Oz? Yip Harburg, lyricist, which of course I mentioned by Ernie and by uh, Harold Meyerson. And then uh, the other, which Ernie mentioned, uh, Dina's book here, which is Fascinating Rhythm, the collaboration of George and Ira Gershwin. So um, are both of those available on Amazon or, or oh, at a bookstore, which I prefer, of course, you support your bookstores, but. Through the University of Michigan. Uh, University of Michigan, Second terrific. Published through the University of Michigan. And also, I want to two things, and that's it. That's the end. <laughs> One, I did a twenty-year study in uh, in Detroit about uh, when I became a research scientist at the University of Michigan, and the title of the first uh, big uh, sum up was called uh, uh, "Socio Ecological Stress." That was the 12th Street area in Brooklyn, in uh, Detroit. And that blew up in riots. Suppressed mm. anger, skin color, and black white blood pressure. So what is, is I was saying with my research uh, a meaning that could uh, set forth many hundreds of other research uh, uh, 
plans and and things uh, back in the 60s. Okay. okay. Yeah. Now the last thing I want to show you is this. This is a drawing by George Gershwin. Oh my goodness. Of Yip Harbor. Oh, how wonderful. Yes. Okay. What a what an extraordinary piece of memorabilia to have. Yes. <laughs> well, George was a good artist. So isn't that the way? There, you know, you're blessed with one. I, you, they, they, they're like triple threats. That's what you'd call them today. They, they have so many talents. <laughs> they're multiple threats. Yeah. Well, Ernie and Dina, thank you so much for spending a little bit of uh, time with me and for sharing just you know the tip of the iceberg, really, in terms of. Um, you know, all the contributions and the legacy of Yip Harburg. And so if, if people want to learn more, I do encourage you to, you know, pick up um, either of those books or um, I believe, you know, there, there are some websites with, with interviews. So you could search either of their names and, uh, and I'm sure some very resourceful links would come up. So with that, thank you both so much. It's right. been an absolute pleasure and right. we will look forward to, well, thank you. We'll look forward to, to talking again soon. That would All be right. wonderful. Okay, be well. Thanks everyone.